Uh, our next speaker, David Maggs, carries on a very active career in both the arts and academia. As an artist, he's touching uh, many disciplines, performing as a pianist, but also writing works for the stage, working on a documentary film, and being increasingly interested and involved in AR and new media experiences. He's the kind of guy bringing a chamber music festival into the immersive interactive space. Two years ago, he launched a, an initiative dedicated to the intersection of arts, health, sustainability, indigeneity, technology, and the natural world. Think about this for a second. David is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability at UBC. And I'll let him explain to you in a much more eloquent way the focus of his work, as I truly won't do justice to him if I try to do it myself. David. Thank you very, very much. I was feeling guilty as I was sitting there <clears throat> because I was thinking about all the times I've stood up and said how grateful I am to be here, and in this case, I really am. <laughs> what an amazing room, what an amazing collection of people. Um, it is truly an honor to be here. I've been asked to sort of speak a little bit about my own um, trajectory from very low tech to higher tech uh, over the past decade or so. And I find uh, it's been so enriching for me to hear what's going on in New York City and Los Angeles and London and Berlin and some of these places. And I, I'm, I think I can maybe connect with some of Nora's questions from this morning, uh, which I took to be inquiring about how you bring that down to the Canadian place, but also sort of regions uh, and more local contexts and communities. Uh, so we can have an understanding of where we want to go from a Canadian perspective, but also how we get there from here. Um, is that playing or is it just going to stay? They use the arrows, okay. Um, so since the Canada Council had their big meeting in March uh, where they announced the Digital Arts Fund, uh, I've been connected with a lot of people who aren't moving uh, in, in, maybe it's correct to say, your world, uh, the digital world, uh, who are starting to feel what's reminding me uh, a lot of Y2K. Remember Y2K? There's, sort of, there's this sort of sense amongst a lot of people in Canada that there's this moment coming where the arts are going to go digital, uh, and we have no idea what life is going to look like when that happens. So I think when we come to a moment like that, it's important for us to ask ourselves the question, is this really a difference of kind, or is this more evolutionary in nature? And I put that question out there not to try and answer it, but to try and hold its possibilities in front of us as we move forward. Um, because I think we can trust very much, and certainly this morning is evidence of that, that our expressive lives are going to continue to thrive uh, in a digital space. But I also think it's worth asking whether the existential stakes do get a little bit higher when we're talking about arts in a digital world as opposed to banking fees or insurance premiums uh, in a digital world. We store very precious things about ourselves in our expressive idioms, and so I think that sort of concern uh, is not misplaced. Although uh, I do think that it can go a little too far. Uh, I come from the tradition of uh, Western classical music, um, and this is a practice that I think in many ways uh, is grinding under the weight of its own orthodoxy. Um, often the processes where this art form tries to engage in change, there's a lot of trouble. I know I've, I've struggled with this myself of trying to figure out what's the baby and what's the bathwater here uh, as we try and evolve. Um, and we see this uh, in a performance tradition that is consumed um, by a pursuit of accuracy. The fundamental virtue of a classical musician is to go out and play correctly. Um, you see this every time there aren't as many uh, people in the audience as you might like. Um, and the immediate response is audience development, right? It's never artistic development because the art is fine, thank you very much. Uh, it's the audience that we need to go and fix. So feeling that I had landed uh, in a world that was not quite as creative um, as I thought it might be, I did the only sensible thing uh, to do at that point. 
I started a chamber music festival in a part of Canada that had never heard of chamber music. The point of doing that was not to evolve the context. This wasn't a gesture of bringing the classics to the great unwashed, but in fact, exactly the opposite, to have the context evolve us, uh, to really live or die by the challenge to create meaningful relationships in the communities where we operated. Uh, and so that pushed us across a number of boundaries, across musical boundaries as we engage with different musical languages, across artistic boundaries as we developed a five-year inter-arts research and creation project, then across art society boundaries as we developed environmental and social justice platforms from which we wanted to operate, and then finally uh, across the digital boundary with the purchase and renovation of St. Pat's Church in Grosshorn National Park, uh, and the renovation of that space into a studio, a digital studio, uh, and then the launching of, I don't know how to do this now. The launching of, of Old Crow magazine. Uh, so this is a digital platform that's meant to carry the cultural and natural vitality of that region uh, out there into the uh, digital world. But you can see that, that at this point, the digital has remained safely on the side of representation. Uh, it's not caught up in the mix of our creative activities. Uh, it's more just tasked with capturing them. And so last year, uh, we started uh, to move beyond that with the purchase of come on, little slide. with the purchase of a convent um, in western Newfoundland I guess the subtext of my talk is real estate deals with the Catholic Church <laughs> um, I don't know why that keeps happening, but I hope this is my last. The purchase of a convent, um, and we are currently now, we've gutted it and we're renovating it into what we're calling uh, a digital immersion lab. Uh, and the approach, I almost pulled this slide out uh, after this morning, um, because the approach that's partly motivating me here is a pretty steady sense of underwhelm every time I try VR content. Now, I saw some pretty fantastic examples of VR content this morning. It's just never happened to me when I had a bucket on my head, although I do need to acknowledge Dominic because I got to try his today, so I'm already moving down the scale a little bit in terms of being convinced. But generally, I just sort of feel like we, we take whatever new multi-million dollar iteration of this technology and then go out and learn to play chopsticks on it and then kind of sit back and wait for the next iteration of gear. Um, and so I'm wondering if appropriate to our sort of scale of operation, there's the opportunity to try and decouple the content development from the tech development such that we can have the time. We heard so much referred to about the time that people had when they were talking about their processes this morning, but to find that time to really push the languages that these instruments are able to speak. So can we stabilize a technical platform long enough to really invade it with our imaginative appetites? I think we've seen the examples from this morning of what happens when people have the chance to do that. I think that's a fairly verified opportunity, uh, at least at a national and particularly at some of the regional landscapes. It's probably coming to the big cities in Canada sooner than later. I think it's probably going to be a long way from some of the more regional and rural areas of the country. So that's partly what this is about. Can we create a network of artists and arts organizations in Canada um, to experiment with this? Uh, focusing, I think, at this point, on this basic question. What is the interactive, immersive version of what you do? So the background for this approach uh, comes from three years of research that we've just completed at the University of British Columbia. Uh, sustainability in an imaginary world uh, was Shirk Insight funded research into the relationship between art and sustainability. Um, it was an immersive, interactive experience that featured the talents of, I think, about two dozen of Vancouver's really dazzling technical design and theatre personnel. Um, built sets, functional rooms, uh, networked projectors, original script and score, um, uh, interactive displays, discrete and ambient audio, video gaming design, MIDI queuing, um, lots of moving parts. Uh, it looked something like this. This is a very short. Where did my play button go?
Uh, so we learned probably a week's worth of, it would take me a week to, to go through all of the things that we learned through this process. Um, most of which I kind of suspect a lot of people in this room already know, maybe knew in the late 90s, and we encountered it uh, over the past three years. Uh, so I want to focus in on just two things that have really sort of become obsessions uh, from the work on that. One of, this, uh, one of these is, is depth and linearity versus interactivity. Um, I, we could say character and narrative here to give you a more concrete sense of, of what I mean by that, but I think depth and linearity are more useful to include the non-linguistic, uh, non-literary forms. Um, interactivity is the behavioral fetish of the digital world. Um, interactivity is also typically at odds uh, with depth and linearity. It's hard to tell a story or write a piece of music with really well-crafted depth and linearity if it is the assumption of the audience that they can interject at any point and change the direction that that piece is going in. Um, I sort of feel like this is something of uh, a fundamental crossroads for this form, uh, in a way. Uh, I sort of imagine it like, a, like the way people were thinking about opera several centuries ago, and there's a guy somewhere back there thinking, you know, I love it when the plot starts to emerge and the characters make themselves known and, and the stakes become clear, but I really love it when people sing. I wonder if they could just sing all the time. No, 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 that would never work, you know? And yet here we are now, sitting in the audience, watching a soprano uh, take 10 minutes to die on a high G sharp, and the only question that we have about it is, well, I wonder if I'm going to go that way myself, you know? <laughs> so these idioms evolve, and so while the technology is working on things like image delay or, or vertigo or these sorts of things, I really feel like this is where we need to be sinking our teeth in from a content creation point of view. Um, that if we can unlock the structural idioms or the formal idioms that help minimize or outright eliminate that paradox, I think we'll really have a much clearer view uh, as to where this, this form is going. Because as much as I loved it, and I really loved it, but as much as I did, I will am admit that eventually I slept through sleep no more. So I know that's probably like scandalous to say here. Um, Another thought on this, uh, categories of art. Um, this was something that we encountered a little bit by surprise. Uh, we had the opportunity to interview all of our audience members on the back end of this experience, and we were a little bit surprised to discover that we really had three audiences at, at the same time. We had people that came to see theater, we had people that came to walk around an installation, and we had people that came to play a game. And what we were then able to do was correlate those initiating assumptions with really different levels of coherence, comprehension, and satisfaction. So this turned out to be a huge issue because depending on what you think you're doing, you set that signal to noise ratio really differently such that really different things are information and really different things are background. You can imagine the last time that you walked into the National Gallery, went up to a painting on the wall and remarked on how flat it was. Like that never happens. You just, it, you eliminate that piece and you pay attention to the colors and the lines. That's looking at a painting. This field is so unstable in terms of what its idioms are, it's very hard either on the creative or the consumption side to make any safe assumptions about what people think they're doing, and yet that's really important. So I'm not proposing that you try and flatten that variability, but just that you pay really close attention to it uh, in, in your dramaturgical processes. Uh, okay. So that's, that's it for me. So my lessons sort of tracking my way through this are when it's time to go digital, trust the long game, fret the short game. I thought we were in the land of golf courses, so I would use it that way. Uh, don't get stuck developing the audience instead of the art. Don't mistake representation for creation. Don't get stuck on the tech roller coaster. And once you roll up your sleeves, mind the categories and beware of the, interac the price of interactivity. Thank you very much.